Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello and welcome to The Money Factor. I'm Richard Naylor, your host. Today's topic is downsizing our living space. My guests are Helen Bolk, president of Beyond Clutter, and Amy Vanderplug, retirement counselor at East Wick Village, East Wick Village in yes. uh, North Greenbush. Correct. Great. Welcome to the show. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Downsizing is something that I guess um, is painful for some people. Uh, changing houses, just changing from the same size houses is difficult for some people. So I think that's going to be an interesting topic. But before we jump into it, I'd like to get a little background on both of you. Helen, uh, you've done some books. You've been involved with uh, a lot of things with clutter and organization. Right. Could you, could you talk a little bit about how you got into that and, and then lead up into our topic today of downsizing? Sure. Um, well, I'm educated as a musician, a teacher, and a lawyer, which is probably why I like to do workshops and talks, because I like to stand on my feet, uh, and I'm used to talking to groups of people. Um, and I practiced law 17 years before I started Beyond Clutter in 1991. But I think my most important credential is that I used to be a pack rat. I was raised by pack rats, but I chose many years ago to live a clutter-free life. Now, for me to do that, I knew I needed to downsize my space. If I just got rid of possessions and stayed in the big 10-room house, chances are I'd just fill it again. So I moved from a 10-room house with a garage, attic, and basement, all of which were full, to a six-room condo that had no garage, attic, and basement. So I learned the um, importance of deciding uh, to take things with you you really want to live with. And um, from that experience, I started Beyond Clutter because I knew the pain of living with clutter and the benefits of living clutter-free. And I knew, um, I found through my own experience, a process that works so that I want to help other people declutter and de-stress their lives like I've done. And certainly that's a component of downsizing. So yeah, I'm very passionate about um, getting people out of this lifestyle of living with an awful lot of things that in the long run we acquire because we think they're going to make our lives better. But when we hold on to them too long, they sometimes acquire this negative impact called clutter. So we're carrying around a lot of things that we don't need to. We do, and that's when it builds up. Great. Amy, uh, I noticed from looking at your resume, you've been helping seniors for quite a while uh, with have. some of these issues. I have. I've been in the senior living business, if you will, for over 15 years, um, worked in a number of different settings, but all with older adults who are in the process of making the decision to move out of their house into some other living situation. Some people doing that um, because they have the foresight to know that down the road that's going to be a better option, and other people who are in crisis mode mm -hmm. and need to make a change right away. So I've kind of, I've, I've seen it all, but I greatly enjoy working with seniors and I really enjoy sort of peeling back the layers of the onion when you work with people um, around what is generally an emotional issue. You know, leaving their house, parting with some of their possessions. Um, that's very, gets very emotional. Very and personal. I just, very personal. So my title actually is retirement counselor. And some people say, well, you know, why, why that counselor term? I mean, you're selling apartments or something. But it really does become kind of a counseling role because um, people share things with you, you know, that many times they don't share with their own families. And I'm very privileged to, you know, be a part of that and help people to m make the best decision. That sounds good. In downsizing, uh, people, and, and what we really want to talk about today is the downsizing process. But in order to do that, I think we have to look at a little bit of 
kind of what are people faced with. So what are the options? What kind of situations do you get? Uh, nursing home, uh, I, I think you, it's called independent living at some point. Uh, what, what kind of options are there that people have to deal with in terms of uh, downsizing? And you know what, I think it's really interesting that the first thing that you just said was nursing home because so many people, if you talk about um, the option, you know, what's the next step if they're gonna leave their home, everybody thinks nursing home, and you know, that's not where I'm going. And even when we talk about independent living, in their mind, people have this idea that somehow it's a nursing home. We've all visited people. And you know, most people would say, that is not where I want to ever end up. Right. So that's not the option that we're talking about, and unless, of course, that is the situation because of the person's health. But for most people, they have been in their family home um, 40, 50 years. It's amazing. You, you, know, this, you can accumulate a lot of... You can accumulate <laughs> a lot of stuff, but also that attachment to that home. In many cases, it's a house that you know, a couple built literally built themselves, raised their family there. So, but it gets to a point where people kind of know in their head, um, this doesn't make sense anymore. We're not able to maintain everything the way we used to. So we have to think about downsizing. Now that's a term that everybody uses, although they use it to mean different things. When they're talking to me and downsizing, they're usually talking about the physical space that we live in. Not so much yet the stuff, but the space. Right. Okay, okay, well, we have a four-bedroom house with three bathrooms. You the know. things are the implication. Right? Yes, Once you yeah. Get... So if you talk about the options for, for senior living, um, the first option, of course, people could say, well, we're going to move out of a house, we're going to move into a condo or a townhouse. You know, a lot of times that's the next step, or people think that would be the next step. I don't have to mow my lawn. I don't have to shovel the snow. That can sound good to a 30 or 40 year old, too. Exactly. Yes, it does. <laughs> but the time when people are talking to me about that being a possible option, they're generally in their 70s or 80s. Okay. And what I say to them is, well, while moving to a maintenance-free community like that solves one of your issues, it does not solve all of the issues. Especially when you talk about people who are in their home and they're starting maybe to get a little bit isolated in that home you know, they're no longer able all the time to seek out social opportunities. Well, if you move to a condo or a townhouse, that doesn't buy you anything in terms of additional socialization or support. You know, you still could be surrounded by neighbors who go to work in the morning, come home at night, close that garage door, and you don't ever hear. They're walking hear their kids them. and the dog, and right. they don't fit. So, that is not, in my mind, always the best solution. For a 40 or 50 year old, maybe it is. You're, you know, you're having the time of your life, you don't wanna worry about mowing the grass, that's great. But for a 70 or 80 year old, I don't know that that's the right step. So the next thing would be an independent living kind of setting, and there are lots of options out there, and Eastwick Village is just one of them where, yes, all of those maintenance things are taken care of, but you also have a whole lifestyle that goes along with it. And that doesn't just mean that maybe there's tennis courts or a swimming pool. It means that there's purposeful activities in place to meet all of the needs for that older adult, whether those are social needs or physical needs or emotional support, it's all right there. Now you can take some and leave some, correct? Absolutely, because it's nothing is forced about it. So again, just to kind of circle back around, when people talk to me about downsizing, they're, they're first of all talking about moving into a smaller space that would be easier to maintain. Okay. So I say, great, that sounds good. But then we get to the stuff, you know, and, and people suddenly go, oh my, what am I going to do with all this stuff? And then that's when I call in Helen. My 4,000 <laughs> photos from and, my And to me, grand. downsizing, when I think of it, I agree with Amy. It includes shrinking your space. Because if you're not shrinking your space, you're basically decluttering. Um, there are exceptions to every rule, and someone might be downsizing because maybe their kids are moving home and they have to make room. But 
regardless, uh, that's an exception. Or their elderly the parents. Or their elderly parents are coming in and suddenly they have to empty one or two rooms. Right. That's a, but to me, that's really not downsizing. So I agree with Amy. A key component to downsizing is the plan to shrink your space. And getting rid of your possessions is simply enabling you to do that because if you have enough possessions like I did for a 10 room house and I want to move to six rooms, I have to do something because there won't be room for me. Could you define what clutter is? Because, you know, it's, what does that mean? Uh, does it mean I'm messy or what? Um, some people who are messy are clutterers, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're messy. Um, I know some very organized clutterers. Clutter, <laughs> it, clutter is a variety of things, but what's easier for me is to tell you what doesn't clutter your life. Okay. Which are the things you use. Now, I don't mean the things you put in the attic because maybe you're going to use them someday. So, the carpet that we replaced, how can you throw it away? Right. right, it goes down the basement <laughs> rather than out the door. Right. So basements are prime clutter areas in my way of thinking. And the other area, because we're human, are things that, what, the things that don't clutter your life, I mean, are things that bring you joy. The sentimental items, okay. the photographs. But I use joy because a lot of people say, oh, I love this cup. And I don't believe you should love inanimate objects. But um, items that you look at go, wow, that was a fabulous time. Those are the sentimental things you want to keep even though you don't use them. Clutter are things you don't use, but they're obvious. They're heaped in piles and mounds, and they're everywhere you can find. You trip over them. They're on the staircase going up, going down. It's very well, obvious Well, that could be stuff. the clothes that you wear, but the, you get behind in the laundry and you throw things all over. Correct. And so how does that fit in? That's just being messy, right? That's not something you need to get rid of. You need to get organized, wash your clothes, put them in the basket when they're dirty, that kind of thing. Well, yes, but I find in my experience that most people who just throw their clothes because um, rather than put them in a basket is usually because they not only don't have the basket where it's supposed to be, but also because if it was easy for them to put something away, they would do it. So my guess is their closets and drawers are crowded and there's no more room, so they throw it so on it the back confusing. of the chair. What do you do with all this stuff? Right. Right. It struck me from looking at all this that there seems to be two components here. You talk about the psychological, and then you talk about the, the need just to change from 10 rooms to six or, or six rooms to three or two, two three, right. or one. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So how, is one more important than the other, or how do you look at both of them? So we can kind of take a picture of those two dynamics that we're dealing with. Well, I, yeah, let me jump in, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. You cannot separate the two. And I don't know that people always understand that when they're talking to me first. So again, they're talking to me about changing to a smaller space. And then, for instance, when I'm showing somebody in an apartment and they look at the space and they say, well, there's no way that I can fit my current life in this space, you know, and of course they're not going to be able to, and that's where Helen comes in. But it's not as easy as just saying, okay, I've made the decision that I'm gonna to go to a smaller space, so I need to cut my possessions in half, or I like your, and, and you'll, yes. you'll talk about the, the math part the of it, because that's very logical. But logic doesn't always come into this, because people are emotionally attached to their things, whether that's a rational thought or not, they are. I, I was just speaking to somebody this morning when I mentioned the show, and she said, you know, I'm going through my things, and I have all the, the, the report cards from my children. Right. You know, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it means a lot to her. Right, and how throwing those away somehow feels like I'm throwing away, you know, the things from my children's childhood. And, and I think that we react more strongly to loss even than we do to gain. We do. We do, and Helen is very good at talking people through 
that emotion part of it and explaining that just because you're throwing away those report cards doesn't mean you're throwing away the memory. That's correct. And there are options to throwing them away. And one of the most obvious options in my way of thinking is to give them back to the kids. So, but um, you know, a lot of times the kids are 25 and they, they don't just, want them. They don't, they don't want them. They don't they're want not going to know that, that they shouldn't have thrown them away until they're 50 or 60. And then they're going to say, oh, I wish. Yeah. But how the parent presents it to the child is important. I, I once had a person with triplets. And she um, had all their everything. They had their baby clothes, their little shoes we always had when we were little, and the report cards. And their, actually, she had their bedspreads when they were little and everything. She saved it all. And she didn't know what to do with it because she, too, was downsizing. And so I just suggested she go out and find three gorgeous containers that match the favorite colors of each girl and make a little house box for each of them choose from each of what she has and present it back at the holidays or for a birthday. Do marketing. <laughs> yeah, do some marketing. And, and then you get them excited about seeing the rest. I mean, there's a way to do it. And you know, I've been doing this business long enough that I can often suggest options to throwing them away. One of my favorite is um, if you have a bunch of items that are sentimental, but you know, like report cards, you're not going to use when you move to a facility like Eastwick. Um, but you can, you know, make the bed, lay out a nice bedspread, and take photograph of one photograph of all of them. Mm -hmm. And my point is, you develop a collage of all these pieces that have left your life, and you collage them, frame them, and you put them on the wall of your living room at Eastwick. And then you actually will probably enjoy them more than when they were up in the attic. Right. So you can turn what seems to be sadness or a deprivation into a moment of joy. How and do you talk to people in terms of what the children really want or are likely to want? You know, it struck me that, OK, if my parents had saved my report cards, I would think, eh. You know, mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm 60-something, so you know, it's not that I'm I'm just not going to care. But you know what I really miss? If, if my parents had saved something from their own lives, that would mean more to me. Yeah. Mm. You know what is interesting about all of this that we're talking about, and this comes back to the peeling away the layers, is really usually what the heart of the matter is, is fear. There's fear at the core. People. Um, who are making the hard decision that it's time to leave the house and now you're telling me I have to part with a lot of my stuff, even things that are important to me or sentimental. There's a fear there that somehow if I get rid of this stuff, um, does it, I don't know, what does it mean, you know, that my life none of this mattered or is this because you're throwing it away a sign yeah. maybe that i'm you know i'm getting that much closer to the end of my life and what i see often in my line of work is that it's not just the fear in the parents but the adult children have a fear also so now mom is trying to give me this christening gown that she's had <laughs> for 55 years i don't want it but and the mother is thinking, why doesn't my daughter want this? Why doesn't she care more about this? And the daughter is thinking, oh my gosh, my mother is thinking that she's going to die. And now I'm faced with thinking about the fact that my parents aren't going to live forever. And this just can go around to some people just get stuck. They just get stuck with that fear and it's easier to do nothing than to face you know that this is a natural next step in all of our lives and it doesn't have to mean anything negative it doesn't have to mean anything scary it's just all right being realistic but also um, we're going on to the next phase to the next stage this is a positive thing and I don't know that people can always identify that it's fear at the heart of it. 
there's a phrase in my work that is really true. It's the fear of letting go. Yeah. And behind parting with anything is that fear of the unknown. So our own and lives as well. Exactly. Yes, yes. And, and the meaning of it and what does this say. Right. And as Amy said, you know, you've got to peel that back because that fear is what's preventing the person from picking up their lives and starting anew. Um, it's probably as difficult as it is um, when you're younger, starting your first job and you're leaving the family and moving somewhere else. And sometimes reminding them that they've done this before is a help. But the fear of letting go is um, when you're dealing with a family, and which is why when I meet with a potential client, I ask the family to be there. So you get the children as well? I get the children as well. And it's not uncommon that the children have come to me because the communication is difficult in the family, but an outsider can sometimes break through some of that. Yeah. that fear and I see exactly go. the same thing. Yeah. And often I offer, you know, let me just come for like two hours and sit down and present a different approach. And uh, in my workshop, I always say that one way of looking at this is how wealthy you are and that you have possessions to choose among. Mm. You're re-choosing what you want in your I life. I like that. And not all possessions are meant to be with you forever. Yeah. I not. like that too, re-choosing. You re-choose what you're going to have with you and what's going to serve you. And it's really, I think, so crucial with the clientele uh, that Amy deals with because, you know, when we're younger, we, ha we get sidetracked with actually who we are because we have obligations. And uh, stresses. And, and stresses and uh, raising children and job stress and all of this. And we compromise. And now at this age in life, here they are with a chance to refine themselves and, and be authentic, as I like to say. And if you can get past that fear, peel the layer, like Amy says, they brighten right up yeah. with the possibility of yeah. new friends and new places. Yeah. But you got to get past yeah. that. That's great. And sometimes in the downsizing, I can, you know, I'm often called a clutter counselor. I can work them through yeah. the mental and emotional pieces. Downsizing, decluttering is not just physical. Attached to it is this fear and other negative feelings, as well as um, the thoughts that generate the stuff. Oh, maybe I'll need it someday, or you know, it was given to me by my grandmother. How can I part with it? And all this fear about who I may be because I'm letting this go. And once you get past that, and you meet the nicest, most um, thankful people. People at their best. At their best. Just well, yeah. On the, when you see on the other end, once they've gone through it, once they've moved into their new setting and, and you know, have gotten settled, then you're right. Sometimes you talk about your authentic self, and then that's what you see on the other side. It's just getting there is a hard process. You know, I often see that, I don't know if you've noticed, at the end of the seminar I do for Eastwick, that people will come up to me, right. I know Amy's really busy, um, and thank me for giving them a different way and l helping them start to let go of the fear. It's obviously a process and it will take time. And you, people start to smile. They're not smiling when they walk in. They're like, oh, what am I going to do? Yeah, what is she going to say? What is she going to make me do? What am I gonna, yeah, what is she going <laughs> to say I have to do? And I don't want to do I that. And it's not unusual, I'm sure, that both of us um, see tears. Oh, yes, yes, in, we do. In our work. You know, because mm -hmm. it is very emotional. We both mm -hmm. talk to people about things that are really hard to talk about. Um, you know, and on moving day, it's very stressful, and we see a lot of tears as people are moving in or even the next day. But then, again, you get, you know, a couple weeks or a month out, and they're like a whole new person. That's right. That's and encouraging. It, it really, I think mm -hmm. attitude plays a huge part, and I'm sure that you see this as well. I mean, if somebody ha comes in with an attitude like they're digging in their heels and I don't want to do this and my wife is making me or my kids are making me, you know, that's, that's harder. 
Whereas if somebody looks at it as, okay, this is the next step. Yes, it's hard. I don't want to leave my home, but I know this is the right thing to do. They set themselves up to have a better experience. I had one woman years ago, and this just stuck with me because I thought this is such a great analogy. She said, you know, I just feel like it's kind of like when we all went off to college as freshmen. We were really scared to leave our parents home. We were excited. We didn't know what was going to happen. None of, you know, we're in a new environment. We don't know each other, but it's an adventure, you know, and that's really the way. I mean, if everyone could look at it that way, it, it would be such a positive experience. It strikes um, me that if you can design your future in such a way that it's possible for you, based on your own history and, and desires, to create that in such a way that you say, I see something positive there. That, that would be a big bridge in order to get over to uh, this new, new chapter in their life. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I wish that we could mag magically make that happen. A magic wand. You we, know. you know, we can't. I mean, people really do get bogged down in all different ways with their stuff. You know, it mm -hmm. it sort of helps identify do. them. I mean, we, I think, during our you know career years and family years, we're just accumulating more and more and more, and mm -hmm. it helps us feel mm -hmm. you know more important or whatever to have all these things. And then to be to a point where you're starting to shed that is scary. Yes. We could probably do a, our show on, on the next part of this, which is uh, what do you do practically? Uh, it's been said that a lot of times you just don't know how to do what you're trying to do. So any, any advice of where to start yeah. in downsizing uh, so that they get going in, in a positive way? I, um, yeah, I, I have pretty uh, strong feelings from my own personal experience and working with people for these 20 some years that you start with the easiest stuff, not the hardest. Um, it's like school. You gotta go to kindergarten before you can go to 12th grade. You don't start with calculus and then learn one and one is two. You have to do the easy things. And well, that so, implies that there is a structure. So I guess that's yeah, where we have to let structure. them know that there's a. There is a right and wrong way. Because I have let go of, I don't know what I've let go of in all my years. And I have no regrets, none. In fact, I can't even think of some of the stuff I let go of until I see it at a garage sale or somebody <laughs> else's house. Oh, I used to have one of those. But I don't have any regret. And there's a way of doing that. Um, and I find that we talked about the difference between downsizing and decluttering, that if you start with the decluttering piece, that is getting rid of the stuff you're not using and doesn't bring you any joy, it's, it's important. And um, we talked a bit earlier about why it's important to start downsizing before you even know where you're going. And my feeling is as soon as you have the thought that you're going to, to change and move and low and um, reduce your living quarters, you should be downsizing because it can take a year, mm -hmm. but it's basic physics. Now, I love about mathematics, but physics, there's a great commercial on TV, a body at rest tends to stay at rest, but a body in motion tends to stay in motion. Newtonian mechanics. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> so once you start letting go of expired things and out of date things and ratty kitchen towels and and burned plastic spatulas and uh, magazines that are three years old and moldy that have been in but the But Diana, the it was Diana's uh, death, you know. <laughs> well, then you hold on to that for a little longer and you get rid of all the rest. Yeah. Okay. The things so pick, that pick, tongue. Pick the top part. Right. You s put aside anything that's tough. Your job is quantity at the beginning. You want to double your trash and recyclables. You want to e start eating up your pantries. You want to go through your freezer, get rid of freezer burn food. You get rid of anything that's a hazard, stuff on the staircase, for example, um, um, expired uh, items from the pharmacy, whether um, prescription or not to um, prevent in, you know, accidental ingestion. You want to 
get rid of that 10 to 20 percent that clutter our lives and almost all of us have it. This is probably an impossible question. Go ahead. But how long, how long should you start ahead? Because, I mean, just thinking about the, the, chemical, the chemicals, the, the prescriptions in the cabinet, what do you do with them? You have to think about that. You can't throw them in the toilet. That's not allowed. You can't give them away. You have to get rid of them, and it takes time. How do you? How long would this process take if you were, let's say, a normal person with uh, not not like extraordinary amounts of things, but a normal client? Well, if we're talking this age group of mm -hmm. seniors, mm -hmm. quite often, um, you know, we become a little slower than we used to be, and I usually find that if you give them a year, they'll get through it. But I've moved people in six weeks. It's much more intense. Yeah, Amy mentioned that in the beginning of you can do that starting yeah. early. Right. You have to start early. And well, it's and this important. is precisely why at Eastwood yeah. Village we bring Helen in to do these seminars because most people have no idea where to start. Mm -hmm. They're completely overwhelmed. I'm talking with them about first of all making the decision to to make a move. That's huge in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Now they say. But you know, what am I going to do with all this stuff? They just literally don't know where to start. And so w whenever we have done the downsizing seminar with Helen, it's like a standing room only crowd because this wow. is everyone's number one issue. Okay. Once they make the decision, okay, we need to move out of this place, then the realization start sets in, you know? And some people, um, cannot physically do the work, mm -hmm. you know, and then they need to um, hire someone, Helen or, or someone else, who can come in and literally make arrangements to have a dumpster in the front yard, you know, take the stuff that's going to Salvation Army, um, get the stuff together that's going to be sold or donated or whatever. You know, some people just physically can't do it. Others are able to do it, but they don't know where to start. And what I find is people, when, when they first hear about downsizing, they think, you know, I, I have to do all of this at once. And I really <laughs> like in your seminar when you talk about, you know, start with the easy stuff. Mm -hmm. Because right away they go to the, the 16 photo albums in the basement. Oh, yeah. and they how, go with the hardest. You know, that's think. the hardest thing. Yeah, oh well, my, how do I get rid of my, you know. Why don't we just start with this one drawer? Because that's probably what you're thinking about the right. most. Sure it is. Right. You think about the hardest thing to let go of. And, um, but th that's why the method I use is to know you think about all the easy things to let go of. So it moves their mind into a different slot that says, I can do this versus, oh, no, I can't. Right, and, and then if they try effect. some of those things and they're successful with it, it's kind of like, well, this isn't so bad. I can on. do this. Now I can take the next step. Because when they get to the photos, what happens is they start to look at every picture. And now they remember yes. that day. And then sometimes, you know, there's all emotions that well up. And then everything grinds to a screeching halt because now we're stuck over this. Now you have tears with oh, no, no progress. No. <laughs> that's sad. So that's what some, sometimes it's a tough love. And the Helen is the tough love. <laughs> I can be a tough love. We can bring we can bring in the hired guns and say, <laughs> you know, because I think that you have a wonderful way with people that you can get them to do things that they don't want to do, but you use humor mm -hmm. and your own life experience, mm -hmm. and you just have a very nice way of moving people in the direction that they need to go. Thank you. You know, whereas if their kids said to them, well, mother, you need to get rid of all this stuff, what do you think happens? Yes. And yes. You dig in the he heels. Yeah, all of us would. Any of, of us course. would. If we're told to do something we don't want, we get the arms bent and we're going, yeah, over my dead body. Good. I have to agree, me too. Yeah, <laughs> right. I think we're all that way. And it's what I remind children. I put children, and when I have to deal with the kids, I often, and kids, they're often older than I am, but I say to them, you know, what would happen if someone told you you had to get rid of your favorite golf clubs? Right. They would just, and they tell me, I said, well, what do you think's happening with your parents? I mean, hello. Right. And I give them a way to approach their parents, and it's, there's ways of doing things, but people in this facing, this life change at this age yeah. um, can't see through that. They got little blinders, but all of us would. All of us would. And I always treat them as if they'd be my mother. 
and uh, I lost my parents, and I'd say, okay, if this was my mother, what would I want someone to say to her? <laughs> How would I want someone to help her? And that's what I do. And after the seminars, people come up to me, and some people are not only thanking me, but others have other questions that they aren't too embarrassed to ask. And I deal with them all, as, as many as I can. It strikes me that we could go on for three hours, probably, and <laughs> oh, yeah. not finish. Let's see if we can come up with um, maybe two types of advice. Uh, the first one, how, did they, how does somebody decide how much space they should even think about downsizing to? Because I know you can get a studio apartment in some places. You could get a two-bedroom, that's fairly common, or a one-bedroom. How do you face that decision? Because based on that, you're going to also eventually have to deal with more or less space? I think from my perspective, um, unfortunately, a lot of times it comes down to finances. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I mean, I think most everybody that I talk to would like to have as big of space as what they could afford. And a butler. I guess, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, what I would say does not work, and I have seen this, if an adult child comes with mom and mom has lost her husband, so it's just her, but she's living in the family home and the son or the daughter were looking at an apartment and they say, well, mom only needs one bedroom. Mom, you don't need more than one bedroom, it's just you. You know, I feel so bad when that happens. I mean, I understand. Because what, what do you say at that point? I can't say anything right. except, you know, to... I wish they weren't saying that. Well, yeah. <laughs> and, and sometimes I'll turn to the mother and say, you know, it's, they mean well. Right. Because they do. But... Uh, she needs this to analyze just, her life, right? Right. And this is, just goes back to their telling her what to do. You know, now it's role reversal, which the parent does not like that role reversal to begin with. Oh, it's absolutely. very demeaning. But can that now, poison the whole well here? It can, and that's, that's my job then to turn that around because that isn't going to help anybody. Right. Um, and so, you know, when you talk about space, uh, uh, unfortunately, most people don't really often have the luxury of being able to say, hmm, do I want a one bedroom or a two? I mean, a lot of times it does come down to what can they afford. And then, I mean, yes, to some degree, how much space do because I need Because that second bedroom could be need. more than just another person. What if they do photography their whole life and they'd like to have a exactly. room for that? Or and that's the whatever, kind of or a thing. knitting room, or right. I don't know. That's what I talk to people about. You know, And usually, one of the good, I think, good questions that I will ask people is where do you spend the most time in your home right now? Because they say, well, I have a four bedroom house. I couldn't possibly live in a two room apartment. But when I ask them, where do you spend most of your time? They say, well, the kitchen and, and the family room. And the family room. <laughs> right, of course. Not the formal dining room, not the formal living room, and yet they're counting this space as space that they need. You know why? Because it's full of stuff. There's stuff in there. So of course I need all those rooms. It's full of stuff. Well, you don't need a dining room table that seats 12 people if you live in a retirement community. You don't need a formal living room for entertaining. In fact, when was the last time that you actually entertained in your formal living room? You know. In a nice way, I try to get people to see that, well, you're right. I really only live in these two rooms. Well, then let's recreate those two rooms here. How and for the amount that probably work? that they could pay for that second bedroom, they could rent a room in a restaurant several times a year. That's exactly. And they could have 50 people well, there. Well, the reality, most retirement communities have a space mm -hmm. that residents can use. So <laughs> again, that's part of my job to point that out. And then they say, oh. Oh, okay. I can so do that. So I then. could have Thanksgiving dinner over there. As a, it doesn't have to be in my apartment because, of course, it, w it wouldn't fit. So I mean, that's kind of the first step. And then the next step is, you know, now how much stuff am I going to have to get rid of in order to fit in this space? And when you said the re-choose, I really like that because mm -hmm. something that I've often said to people is walk through your house with a sticky pad and look at your furniture now. We're just talking about furniture. What things would you buy all over again? What pieces do you 
love and you use and you really want to keep those mm -hmm. and put a sticky note on that as opposed to every single thing that you have in your house. I mean, do you really need four bedroom sets anymore? No, of course not. Right. You know. I mean, I had a four bedroom house and no room for guests. I mean, just because they, <laughs> they have a four bedroom house doesn't mean it's being used. They're right. I mean, bedrooms, but. Exactly. Like right now I have an 830 square foot apartment and um, I have two bedrooms, but I'm already looking at one bedroom. And what Amy is saying is so true. I'm looking at where I spend my, most of my time but I have a business, just like if an elderly person had a hobby. Mm -hmm. So where's the business going to go if I eliminate the second bedroom? And then you have more room because you've actually designated and, and designed it to fit what you like to do. Right. So I've started letting go of furniture, and she's right. You have to start with the big pieces. And what I tell people is you need to have a spiral notebook, and you should start down room by room and make a list of the big pieces you have to have with you or life isn't worth living. <laughs> you, go up to a high level and then the pieces that you'd be glad to get rid of, so your yeses and your noes, and then everything else falls in a maybe category. Okay. So you have to start analyzing and looking at who you are and what you want. Then the issue of where will it go becomes also a factor, but not before you decide. So if, and if, then you have to look at options. If you really have a handmade, uh, carved uh, dining room set table, um, and you know you can't take it, and you wish you could, now what do we do? Okay. And then I offer options, as, as Amy would, if she had, you know. We, that's the whole point. The, the last, the, the, the other question that I had, there's too much to cover, right? Uh, that's why you, you do what you do. That's mm -hmm. right. And, and we can't go through all the emotional issues and all the advice that, that we could cover. What are the resources? Let's say you wake up today and you realize that next year, ideal case, you're going to be downsizing. What kind of resources in the community and your family do you think people might not think of, and they should, uh, there's your company, there's, you work in an in a independent living mm -hmm. place. I never knew that somebody like you existed. <laughs> so you know, what, what, what should I know at that point? Who might be out there? Who might I turn to? Well, I, I actually, if you're thinking about doing it, um, there are some fabulous websites out there. If you were to put in uh, like downsizing possessions, you'll come up with dozens of websites that have free information that can give you some ideas about what the process would be like. Um, I don't always agree with all of them, but they will open your mind to possibilities. Um, also, um, there's, I believe, some government um, eight, uh, sites that talk about all the variety of senior housing available. I came across a book in the library. Um, yes. Well, the uh, Albany Gardeny, uh, Guardian Society Has um, puts out a spiral bound book every year. I came across that on the, the shelf. Options. That's a wonderful resource. Mm -hmm. That's for you know senior living options. Mm -hmm. But in terms of getting started with downsizing, I mean, Helen is right. There's a lot of information. Right, information. You know, there's books in the library. There's stuff on the internet. I think Helen's website. You have a ton of resources I listed do. on now, your. How would they reach your website? Just put in Helen Volk. Um, they would put in. They could put in Helen Volk, and you'd be amazed uh, how many Helen Volks there are put in this in country. Um, <laughs> yeah, Helen Volk hosts New York. They could put in Beyond Clutter, which okay. is the name of That's my business. Easy. Right. And if they put both of those things, they're going to get you. For oh, sure. they're definitely going to get me. And I actually have uh, a page called Pass It On, that lists 60 local nonprofit organizations and their wish list. That is the kinds of items they want. So when a person is getting to the point that they need to get rid of things, family doesn't want them, but they want to donate them, here's a, a, a resource geared to the capital district that does the homework for you, and it gives you all the contact information so you can call and say, hi, you know, I have blah, 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 blah. Are you interested in them? And if so, you can even ask, and I recommend you always ask, can you come and get them? Okay. Because I find that organizations who want something and you have a quantity 
often will go out of their way to find a way to get it. And then you know they want it if they're right. willing to pick it up. Right. That isn't always the case. Okay. Right. And um, uh, there are very few professional organizers in upstate New York. Now, when I started 20 years ago, there were four of us in all of upstate New York, myself, one in Rochester, two in Buffalo. I don't think you're going to cover the state uh, No, for but everybody. now there's 100 yeah. in okay. all of upstate New York. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in Albany, um, there's, uh, there's another woman who specializes in seniors, like I do. She's in Saratoga. And so that end <laughs> right. is covered. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of us, uh, a couple of options. Um, Finding individuals is not always easy, but you can go online and do searches for professional organizers, um, Capital District of New York, and some names will come up. Mm -hmm. You've just got to do some homework, but we're not easy to find, necessarily. One more question along the same sure. line. You mentioned sometimes the family doesn't quite have the right comprehensive uh, picture of, of how to help uh, mm -hmm. the, the parents. Mm -hmm. um, how should the parents start out talking to the family about what they are planning so that maybe they kind of keep things in the right uh, order? I think for me and, and my work, I have found that the worst place to talk to family is in your house. Yeah. Because uh, then the kids yeah. start looking, oh, I can have this, I can Ooh. have this, <laughs> or where's this going to go? And they start. Um, or they get sentimental or about. Or they get sentimental. Mom, what do you mean this you're is the mean, house. This is the house that we grew up in. That you need to take the kids out. Yeah. And, and you may need to sell the house. Right. In order to oh, finance. Most, most people do. Right. They have to sell the house. Most people have to sell the house. And that's also why you start downsizing yeah. early, because you've got to prepare the house for sale. And any real estate agent is going to say, clean it out. Yeah. So um, right. take them out to a neutral space. And I think the dialogue is important, uh, not only for the, fam the parents to say, uh, we're at a stage in our life where we want to downsize. Right. Um, but you have to hear what the children's point of views are. And in neutral space, I think it's easier. Yeah. And different people have different approaches. Yes. I have some couples that, you know, because I always ask, because the family dynamics are going to come into play mm -hmm. one way or another. So I want to know, you know. And some people will say, well, um, we make our own decisions, and we, you know, we'll tell our kids when we've made the decision where mm -hmm. we're going. So that's one approach. Um, but I think if the adult children are worried, well, where are we going to go for Christmas? You know, they, kids, kids can lay a guilt trip on and mom and dad, too. Right and they don't. And so, you know, sometimes the parents w would better take approach where they would say, you know, this doesn't mean that we're not going to be spending Christmases together. It's just it's time for somebody else to step up and host the exactly. party instead of always being at our place. <laughs> right. And it's okay to say that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I have to remind people that it's okay to say that. Mm -hmm. You know, every holiday does not need to be spent at your house. No, and, it's and, the, and the mother will say, oh, yeah, because it's oh, so, it's you know, I don't even enjoy it. It's so much <laughs> yes. work or whatever. Yes. I mean, there's different, there's different things. There's different yeah. approaches. It's going to differ know. with the family and how many children are local versus right. are, maybe they're not local. Right. That's and then you've got to, um, and I often um, find that if the parents can get started and we can get them in the right attitude and, um, and they are starting on their way already, the children often come along quicker. Yeah. If the yeah, parents agree. have to depend on the child for help, they, I, it's really hard to say, oh, my kid's not appropriate. But some children are, will be impeding the parents because yeah. of their own issues right. about holding on. Maybe they're clutterers. They can't let go. And they're going to pass that fear along. Um, and it's time for the parents to say, OK, when we're ready, we'll have you come in and choose things, right. but we need to work with someone else. That's great. You've got to, and, and we all both work and try and help the, the seniors find that path of least resistance. Right. That's right. Sounds good. Right. We've covered a lot of ground. I really <laughs> want to thank you. Oh, you're That's very great. welcome. Thank you for having thank us. You. Thank mm -hmm. you.
And I want to thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show, that you tune in again next time, and that you have a great week. Take care. Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel.